Hello and welcome to Just a Walk in the Sun, a monthly podcast from the Herefordshire Light Infantry Museum. I'm the Reverend Paul Roberts and I'm joined by Colonel Andy Taylor. And today finds us in the market town of Ledbury, on the east of the county. We're standing under the iconic black and white market house with its 17 legs, I think it is. Ledbury is famous for its connections with poetry and John Macefield, former Poet Laureate in particular. Its school takes its name from John Macefield. Uh, But there were a number of other people who were prominent in the town as well. Now, why are we here, Andy? We left the listeners last time in a bit of suspense, didn't we? Yes, in this episode we're going to talk about a soldier from Ledbury, Charles Percy Taylor who happens to be my grandfather. And my great-grandfather. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, um, so those... Well, you don't really have to be much of a genealogist to work out that Andy and I must be related in some way. Andy is my uncle, and we shall be talking today. Um, we are having a walk um, around the market town of Ledbury, and we'll be talking about our common ancestor, Charles Percy Taylor, known always as, as Percy Taylor. He was known as Percy, that's right. Unfortunately... He died when I was only about three weeks old, so I, so I've no direct knowledge of him, but through my father, your grandfather, and his other sons and daughter, learnt a lot about mm, him mm. over the period and managed to research quite a lot about him, and he actually had quite an interesting life for a a lad from a small country town, which Ledbury was in the 1900s, early that, 1900s. That's right, because uh, obviously the, the principal thrust of this podcast is from the Herefordshire Light Infantry Museum. Percy did serve with the Herefordshire Regiment, but that's not really where his adventuring started, was it? No, it didn't. I, I, it, it's interesting to know exactly why uh, his wandering started. He was an only child, and talking to my aunt, she said that her grandparents, i.e. Percy's parents, could be quite... Uh, rigid, p- perhaps very Victorian in their approaches, and I suspect that uh, Percy may have been a little bit of a uh, a, a rebel. Mm. And at the age of um, sixteen, he ran away to sea and was a waiter on the Cunard or the White Star ships. The um, he was the he was Ottawa to begin with, was it the SS yeah, yeah. Ottawa, and then um, and then the Lusitania, of course, yeah, which the, we the, we know yeah, of. Yeah, and we, the Mauritania. Hmm. Um, he he was on them for about twelve months, I think, going between uh, Liverpool and New York and Montreal. So. Yeah, that's where his um, first wanderings mm, began. And he, sort of he a, was employed, as I say, as a, as a steward or a waiter. That's right, steward boy, I think he's yeah. described in such, some entries yes, in his, is. his and, discharge book. And, and his conduct is, is always described as, well, it starts describing it as very good. And then it says um, just good. So I don't mm. know whether... Uh, standards change or whether his standards change indeed <laughs> so so in that run up before the, the war he had already seen you know quite a bit of the quite a bit of the world yeah it was a, a close knit place um at ledbury uh, around the, the, the turn of the the last century as many of our herefordshire market towns were um, Percy was a member of the Church Lads Brigade, um, and in fact, another link to our podcast last time, uh, they were known as the um, locally as the Mafeking Boys, weren't they? Yes, that's right. I mean, be- because of uh, the relief of Mafeking when it was declared uh, became known, the local youths in Ledbury gathered together in the high street and got some uh, musical instruments together and were marching up and down the high street playing their instruments, although quite how well they played them, I'm not entirely certain, and making a bit of a racket and uh, were accosted by the local policeman and sent home. <laughs> mm. You can only enjoy yourself so much in Ledbury until you get um, uh, found out by the police. Yeah. And of course, at that time, there was a huge outpouring of uh, of excitement and jubilation with the relief of mafficking and the word to mafic to, was uh, was coined briefly so if you were mafficking like that you probably were marching around in yeah. town playing musical instruments yeah. and perhaps causing a bit of a fuss and, and, and i think a lot of this excitement that there was and support for the forces 
I think many of those young lads who were 8, 10, 12, 14 at that time, they were the generation that enlisted en masse, volunteered en masse on the outbreak of war in August 1914. Mm. And I think much of that was because of the tales that they had heard from these individuals that um, mm. uh, 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 fought in South Africa. Mm, I'm, in the sure, I'm war. sure that's right. Of course, for, for Percy, he came back home after his time at sea and pretty quickly enlisted in the Herefordshire Regiment. In yes, the he did. In, in, yeah, I mean, in the, 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 the Herefordshire Regiment was formed in 1908. And I think it was 19, I think 1909, 1909, I think, he, I think he enlisted. And he enlisted as a bandsman. Uh, whether he had any previous music experience, I don't know, perhaps. He, he was one of those that was uh, playing an instrument in the high street in Ledbury at the relief of Mafeking. So we've moved round to the co-op in the new street in Ledbury to explore more of Percy's story. This site is significant both in the town and in his story as well. It was the site of the former drill hall of C Company, the Herefordshire Regiment, of which Percy was a member, of course. And it was also the site of Percy's place of work. Yeah, he enlisted as a bandsman and then served on through. He, of course, was, was only a part-time bandsman because it was a territorial force. Mm. And he worked at... Hopkins garage as a coach builder which which was his full-time mm -hmm. job and that was that was in Ledbury itself but yes and, it and, was and he, so he would have paraded with the Ledbury company so from uh, from family history um, family stories we, you know we we heard that he would ride his bike from Ledbury into Hereford once a week for band practice yeah I think there were several of them that mm -hmm. used to ride together um, I mean it must have taken them a fair old while and then to have their practice and then to cycle back home and I suspect they didn't pass the uh, anchor it Lugwardine or the um, the trumpet at Trumpet mm, Cross mm. without having to stop and quench their thirst, Indeed, knowing, well it, knowing good old territorial soldiers. Absolutely. Thirsty, thirsty work, thirsty work, all that cycling. So by the outbreak of war, he had been he'd been serving with the Herefords for, for five years. So he yeah. would have he'll have done his initial four years and then would have re engaged. Yes. And we know that he the outbreak of war that he signed the imperial service obligation yep so we do we've he, seen him with badges with his imperial service mm, badge mm, on his mm, right breast um, so so that meant that because at the time territorial soldiers didn't have the, the legal obligation to serve overseas but were invited to make that imperial service mm. obligation the use of the word imperial i think often conveyed that idea that maybe territorials might be sent out on garrison duties maybe to india um, and some some certainly were they were and and that was certainly one of the ideas that the territorial force would actually uh, a mixture of home defense and uh, being sent overseas to police the empire to release regular troops to come back and actually fight the war and indeed that did happen some territorial battalions went to uh, Gibraltar mm. to India and I think to the West Indies as mm. well a and very few territorial units were deployed to France uh, in 1914 mm, that's right. it wasn't until the shortage of troops uh, became apparent and the availability of the territorial forces formed trained units uh, made sense for and they were sent over the first um, the first territorial divisions landing uh, as 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 formations it, from February 1915 onwards but of course the the Herefords themselves they um, they mobilized at the beginning of the war their war stations they they they, they went to Pembroke Dock which was their immediate war station uh, they, they all paraded or they they came into Hereford from their their local drill halls Ledbury Lemster Bromyard mm. Ross on Wye Raider and concentrated in Hereford and then went to uh, Pembroke Dock by train and they were there for about 10 days until they got themselves sorted out and then moved to Oswestry, Park Hall Camp in Oswestry mm. where they, they really settled out and started training with the brigade, the Welsh Border Brigade, which they were part of. Uh, during this time as well, they filtered out those who were unfit, hadn't signed the Imperial mm. Service Order, were too young, and a second battalion was formed. Mm. They were formed out of those people that hadn't signed to, to go overseas. They were principally, principally. But, all, but then the, the first battalion and the second battalion were reinforced then by eager volunteers. Mm. And between mm. August and December 1914, there were 3,000 volunteers mm. to the Herefordshire mm. Regiment. And uh, a third battalion was formed as well. 
And that third battalion became the depot and training regiment. Yeah. So they would send drafts out to the first battalion. That was the that yeah. was the intention. They would receive the recruits, mm. train them, and then send them out yeah. as required. Mm. But going back to, to to Grandad, he he was a bandsman, and in um, August 1914, the bandsmen became Batmen. And uh, I'm not certain to which officer Grandad was a Batman, but in December 1914, they had been on a route march, and the Batmen were cleaning their officers' revolvers. One of the officers had loaded his revolver and not unloaded it. And one of the other Batman jokingly pointed it at Grandad Taylor and said, I'm going to shoot you, pulled the trigger, and lo and behold, shot Grandad in the ch- through the chest, not knowing that the, the revolver had been loaded, mm. which it shouldn't have been, and that he, th- he thought it was safe. So um, he was then hospitalised, but fortunately survived. And perhaps by being shot like that, it may have saved his life, as he didn't go to, um, to G- Gallipoli with the, with the battalion. Mm. It's interesting that the, the Batman, the other Batman that, that shot him, was a chap called Duff Vicarage, also from Ledbury. Duff Vicarage's son was in the same class at school as my father. His grandson was in the same class at school as my brother. And his great-grandson played in the same football team as my nephew. So uh, n- n- no great blood feud. No, <laughs> indeed. No, there was, um, no they were f- forgiven for uh, that mistake, for that accident. And, and I suspect the, the officer in question would have been in, in quite a lot of trouble, I imagine, at the time. I think he probably should have been, mm. but rumour has it that he wasn't. It, 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 was, it was covered up. It's covered up. I'm, I'm not quite certain how you cover up a, a, a bullet wound to the chest. Mm. But mm. anyway, in fact, the officer, I later on found out that the officer concerned, whose name I can't remember at the moment, was the OC of the Ledbury Company. He, after, he served at Gallipoli, but was, uh, his health broke down and he was um, medevaced to uh, UK and died. And at his funeral, I came across the, um, the account of his funeral mm. in the local paper and it mentioned that his Batman private vicarage was at, at, oh, the, right. um, was at the funeral. Yep, yep. So we actually know whose weapon it was was, that uh, that caused the problem. (laughs) Ah, interesting. And now we've walked round to a slightly quieter part of the town, round to Church Lane, where St Michael's sheltered housing flats are. It was here that Percy and his wife Mary first lived their house was part of a set of small half-timbered houses that have long since gone. Percy was, was well enough in February the following year, in 1915, to, to get married to Mary Ann Strangward, who was also um, living in Ledbury at the time. So a local local marriage there. And uh, But I suspect health-wise was still, w- was still probably hmm. recovering uh, because he, he, was, he never served with the, with the first Herefords no, overseas, no, he did he? No, he didn't. It's a bit difficult to work out exactly his war service between sort of 1915, 1916, uh, and it, it is very confusing because it's possible that he left the territorial force because pre-war conditions of service were upheld. So if someone mm. signed on for the, into the territorial force for three years in 1912, when that three years was up in 1915, they could be released. Mm. Mm. So that could have happened. But also, if they were released, then when the Derby scheme and conscription came in, they could then be conscripted. Mm. But I don't entirely understand what happened to Grandad Taylor because he's retained the same regimental number all the way through. Mm. So it would appear that he, he did not leave at any time. He continued to serve right the way through. Perhaps his wound was such that he, he was not fit to deploy overseas. Perhaps as a bandsman, batman, he, his services were retained in the 2nd or the 3rd mm. Battalion. Mm. It, it, it's a little bit difficult to know could be that the band were retained for recruiting purposes and uh, as a bandsman he you know he, mm. he he was doing recruiting duties mm. in the UK 
and certainly uh, once we we're into 1917 and after um uh, during the battle of in the run up to the bat- battle of passchendaele the third um the third battle of Ypres, uh, there was there started to be quite an extensive comb out didn't there of of men who could serve overseas to start yeah. making up yeah. numbers v- very much so after the casualties of the somme in 1916 mm-hmm. which all had to be made up and then the um the continual battle of attrition and the battle of passchendaele which was a great drain on mm. manpower. The volunteers weren't coming in in the same numbers. The conscripts were coming in, but again, slowly. And there was a great uh, need for additional manpower on the Western Front. By this stage, the it was looking that German reinforcements would come from the Eastern Front mm. to the Western Front. So they needed really to build up troops on the Western Front. The French army had mutinied and its its ability uh, was somewhat in doubt. The Americans had entered the war, but their troops really wouldn't start arriving until 1918, 1919. Mm. And then they wouldn't have a lot of equipment and uh, and the training. They would be rather like the uh, the British Army was on, on the first ever Somme, mm. that, that, new art, that new inexperienced untried army. So lots of the men from the base were pulled out and uh, Grandad Taylor ended up going to France with the 1st Battalion, the KSLI, in, we think, late 1917, although uh, his army records do not exist. They're part of the destroyed series from the National um, Archives. They, so he would have fought in France with, uh, with the 1st Battalion, KSLI, over that winter of 1917. Mm. And then along with a, a number of other British units, um, uh, they were the 1st KSLI were sent further south into France to uh, take over um, uh, an additional, additional sections of old French front yep. line yes, uh, and was spread very thin at that time in, the, in, in January, February 1918. And uh, it was, uh, the hammer was about to fall, wasn't it, in terms yes, of the was. Germans' last chance offensive. The, the Germans' last push that the Kaiser schlacked in, um, 19, in March 1918, which was the, uh, the Germans' last opportunity really to win the war. And... Well, they achieved a tremendous breakthrough. Whether they would ever have the momentum and the resources to win the war is not quite so certain. But they effectively ran out of steam, Mm. uh, were then a busted flush, and the Allies then managed to push forward and roll them forward, or roll them back, and um, won the war. But the first KSLI were in the front line, 21st of March, 1918. An interesting layout of ground... Uh, on a forward spur, we we actually went there on the centenary, which you will recall. That's or, right. That's right. Out at a place called just outside a village called Lonnycor. We all travelled out as a, as a family. Really, there was we did, uh, the, yeah. there were all all the male cousins. Um, yeah. We went out. I um I had to sort of slightly chase the rest of the party because I was giving a a talk in Hereford Cathedral the night you all went over yeah. to um, <laughs> um uh, to Belgium first, I think. Yeah. Um, and so I had to sort of drive through the night from from Hereford. So I'm quite pleased to say that I I beat everybody to it. Yeah. I was I, I was in place yeah. by about. Seven o'clock in we, the morning. We, we we woke him up. He was asleep in his car <laughs> <laughs> when we arrived. I, at the, I, at that's the RV. right. I'd I'd already had a, I'd already had a little wander around. And interestingly, at that time, the the, the weather conditions were similar to how they would have been a um, hundred years earlier on the twenty first of March, nineteen eighteen. There was a low, quite a thick, low lying fog on on the battlefield, and. It, certainly from the accounts of nearly all the forward battalions um, and not simply the first KSLI, the, the, the German attacking forces managed to infiltrate frontline positions yeah. um, th- under cover of that, uh, under fog, cover and of that ground fog mist Europe um, yeah and, and when we were there it was it was really quite spooky because uh, there had been a slight frost so when we walked on the grass it was a bit crispy mm. it was a blue sky uh, a gin clear blue sky the sun was rising and there was this eerie ground mm, mist like mm. clearing and almost as paul said almost the exact conditions which occurred you know 100 years before when the german after uh, um, a quite a tremendous artillery barrage their infantry surged forward they bypassed the front lines wherever they could cut units off mm. And Grandad was in one of the companies which was cut off 
and I think they soon realised that, that it was hopeless. We're, t- we're taken prisoner. Mm. It was quite a challenge being spread quite as thin as they were. We imagine t- uh, frontline trenches being continuous uh, earthworks, whereas they were, uh, uh, on this part of the battlefield, they were outposts. Yeah. So they were outposts, um, the idea being that you had a, a line of resistance, so there were outposts that could, could fire on approaching enemy, but then further back there would then be um, a, resistance, um, a resistance line. But because of that fog, those, uh, the use of stormtroopers mm. who, were, uh, who were trying to move in as quickly as possible, um, they were able to, um, they, they were able to, to infiltrate all, all those front lines. And frankly, when, when, when your enemy is firing on you from the front, that's one thing. But when you're being fired on from, from all, all round, all round yeah. um, uh, uh, many, um, uh, uh, many local commanders took that probably sensible decision to, um, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to surrender at that point. There were, there were strong points. There were redoubts that were often held um, for the remainder of that day. Um, Manchester Hill is probably mm. one of the most famous of those. Um, and they, they tended to put up stiffer resistance because they were, uh, they, they were able to do so. Um, but again, they were surrounded. And That's right. Gave and, and the German advancing artillery. troops, they swept on, I, I, I mean, in some places, 10 and 15 mm. miles that first day. Mm. So these um, trenches or small groups of trenches which were cut off, there, were, there was no real hope mm. of, uh, of them being mm. relieved at all. Mm. But it was also fascinating when we were walking around the battlefield, we, we saw two other chaps walking around and they, they seemed to be following us. Um, we, we weren't entirely certain what was going on. And in our best schoolboy French, we said, oh, bonjour. And they said, hello, who are you? <laughs> and it turned out that they were doing exactly the same thing. And it was a father and son and their father, of the grandfather, had served with the first KSMI mm. in that uh, engagement, and he'd been taken prisoner of war as well. Mm. And it's possible, we think, that he may have even served in the same company as, uh, as, as, as my grandfather. Mm. Uh, but we exchanged stories. They had a bit more information, which we didn't have. We had some information which they didn't have. So it, it just made the, the day just that much more meaningful, I suppose. That, it was just ver- a very strange That's right. Day. It was a very, very special day. Um, mm. And I think uh, as we were leaving, we bumped into uh, a, a, another chap who, again, was quite mm. obviously English. And, and rather, than, uh, rather than saying, you know, hello, who are you? We just said, which unit are you from? <laughs> yes, um, and he that. was um, <laughs> he was the he, uh, second, seventh Knots and Derby, yes, which yes. was the next door battalion yeah. to um, Grand. Dad's, uh, Granddad Taylor's first KSLI. So camaraderie a hundred years mm. on, which yeah. was um, which was yeah. rather wonderful. Of course, for Percy, he was then taken prisoner and and held prisoner, possibly in the Limburg area in yeah. in central Had, Germany. Pretty hard time. I mean, some of the accounts of those prisoners that they, they they were kept close to the German front line and did war work, which they shouldn't have done under the Geneva Convention, but they had no option. Uh, but again, he did. He ended up in a uh, prisoner of war camp. In, in the Limburg area. Um, pretty desperate times. Towards the end of the war, there were a shortage of, of almost everything in Germany. And Grandad apparently had a really tough time with food. But one day he was talking to a prison guard who spoke a bit of English. They said to Grandad, where'd you come from? He said, oh, Ledbury. And the, the German guard said to him, oh, I know Ledbury. I was a chauffeur before the war. And I used to drive my boss over to the spa in Malvern. And one day we were driving through Ledbury and the car broke down outside a garage. And we, we had to have um, the people from the garage come and fix it. And it turned out from describing this that this was Hopkins Garage where Grandad Taylor worked. And Grandad Taylor actually remembered a foreign car breaking down and everyone from the workshop going out to have a look at it. Mm. And there's a photograph somewhere of a car outside Hopkins garage. As a result of this, apparently this German guard would bring in extra food stuff and give to Grandad. Now that must have been pretty generous mm. because- mm. They'd have had they, very they, little they, themselves, yeah. wouldn't they? Granny Taylor was told that Grandad Taylor, I, her husband was missing and I think presumed killed in action. And she was receiving a widow's pension and then in July, I think it was, she received a postcard from him saying that he was a prisoner of war. 
So she went to the Ministry of Pensions or whoever it was at that time and said, my husband's still alive, I've got a postcard from him. Can I have my army allowance back, i.e. the allowance from his pay, as opposed to the mm. widow's pension because the allowance was more? And they were saying, no, that postcard isn't sufficient. And the story in the family was that she remained a widow for another six Excellent. weeks until formal notification came through. Came that he was on a prison of war list, yeah. yes. I mean, it makes you realise how difficult uh, life was for the families. Mm, mm. And, um, you know, we, we, we now think of administration done by computers, telephones and emails and everything done so quickly, whereas in these days it was handwritten, communication was difficult, uh, and, and confused mm, mm. so um yeah it, it it really brings it home i think yes how, how trying it was and what the families had to put up with mm, yes tough tough times indeed but happily he survived he was um he was discharged sick at the end of the war wasn't he so, yes he was um, with the civil so, war badge yes um so so he wasn't in um uh, returned to the family um uh, completely in full health but, but came back was a member of the town band the town band carried on his musical traditions mm. yeah yeah, and um, my aunt remembers that w when they were in the band, they were, uh, Grandad played the cornet, and he, he had a, a dodgy knee, whether it's from war service, mm. I don't know, but he, he had a, a, a limp with his left leg, and the other cornet player had a limp with the right leg. So when they were marching through the town, apparently it was quite comical. <laughs> And certainly his his war service made a made a firm impression on him because when his sons uh, were, were looking uh, at the beginning of the Second World War to to join up, he forbade them joining the army, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He told them that uh, that they they should join the navy because if they were going to drown, they should drown in water and not in mud. Although he didn't use the term he mud, didn't use he the used word a, mud. a rather no. less pleasant term. Indeed, <laughs> and and so three of his sons served with the Royal Navy. Yes, they did. In the, yeah. in the Second yeah. World War, they, they, all, yeah. all the sons old enough to um yep. to serve. And, and Grandad Taylor, because of his service with the pre-war service with the um, territorial force, and war service counting double, was awarded the territorial force efficiency medal in 1919 which went with his British War Medal and his Victory Medal. When I first became interested in his history, uh, doing research, I discovered that he was entitled to the Territorial Force War Medal, which had been issued and returned, well, not been issued to him, it had been issued to the Territorial Force Association, but returned to stock. So in 1985, I wrote to the Army Medal Office and was able to claim his Territorial mm. Force War Medal. His medal group, which I have in my position, possession, are the British War Medal, the Victory Medal, the Territorial Force War Medal, and the Territorial Force Efficiency Medal. And of course, he never ever wore that combination no, of medals, no. which is uh, fascinating. Mm. But I think we probably talked and walked enough. I think we ought to just sort of go down and, for old time's sake, have a pint in the Brewery Inn, which is where Grandad Taylor used to drink. Sounds like a very good plan to me, Andy. So here we are in the brewery, Andy, part of Taylor family history, both in modern times as well as Percy's. And of course, the, the landlord in, in Grandad Taylor's time was Frank James, who actually had been a member of the Herefordshire Regiment at the same time. He had served with the King Shropshire Light Entry in the First World War mm. and won the military medal. Oh, well, there we are. That's, um... And the pub was in the family hands for about 80 years. And Frank's daughter, Hilda who was Hilda Partridge. Uh, I remember being in there on one occasion with my father and my uncle, and we're talking to Hilda, and Hilda says, I remember your granddad coming in here, stood over there by the window having a drink, and I'll be pinning their medals on them before they went to the reunion in Hereford. Wonderful. Uh, Frank James was a, a sergeant in the King Shropshire Light Infantry and the Herefordshire Regiment, mm. and he attended a bombing course, I think it was, and on the course, they learned how to uh, throw grenades, to prime them, and also rifle grenades. And about five or six years ago now, his grandson came into the museum and brought in a book, an exercise book, which Frank had written up on his course. It had diagrams and uh, lesson plans, and it was used as his training manual to deliver 
the uh, the lessons to to the uh, to his students. But not only that, together with the manual, there were probably four or five uh, examples and inert examples of uh, rifle grenades, which they gave us as well, which are fantastic. Never seen them before. Really interesting stuff. Really unusual survivors there, aren't they? And a great and a great link with this place where, where we're at now. This um this wonderful pub. You and I know this pub <laughs> yeah. well, don't we, Andy? Yes, we do. <laughs> it's been a, a, a family watering hole for many years, I think. And very little changed over the years. I think there's, this, this bar actually, I think, has a preservation order on it or it's listed or mm. something. Mm. But there are photographs of uh, Grandad Taylor in here in the 1930s and not a lot of change. I think actually there are new curtains, but not, not much <laughs> else has changed. No, in that's here. right. I think there's a, the television, I think, probably wasn't here in, um, in, in their day. And um, a few notices have gone up, but you, you would certainly know your way around here, wouldn't you? If you, you, you certainly you would, mind. yes. Yeah. Now, of course, in Ledbury, there's lots of research um, that's already been done locally, hasn't there, into the men from the First and the Second World Wars? There has. The centenary from the First World War really generated so much research. It was uh, quite incredible. And, and research inquiries to the Regimental Museum oh, quadrupled, or, or perhaps even more than that. Lots from families, some from sons and daughters still, mm. but a lot from grandchildren and great-grandchildren who wanted to know what their predecessor had done during the First World War. And there's a great bit of research work that's been done at St Michael's Church showing where each of the casualties from the First World War, where they lived, and they're sort of plotted on a, on, on a map of Ledbury from that time. There were a, a couple of people that did an awful lot of work and they did a short bio of each of the individuals which is collected together mm. in the church and the map of Ledbury at the time is quite fascinating we think of all of the the housing estates which now exist Long Acres, Queensway, the Langlands, Bank Crescent and all the houses up there none of those existed no that's right and Lower Road which was always known as Newtown in my day or my, my parents always used to call it Newtown it was an isolated town. There was a gap of houses from Bridge Street down to the top of Lower Road. So, yeah, even the map is interesting. Mm, mm. I, I know you've, um, you've been thinking about doing something similar or, or working with other people to compile something similar for the Second World War. Yeah, we're just beginning to look at this now because the, the, those that served in the Second World War, very few, if any, are still around in Ledbury. But their sons and daughters are around and the memory of those individuals that served will still be there. So perhaps it's now time to capture that and to look at all of the Ledbury people that served. Because, of course, for the Second World War, there were lots of uh, females that served mm, in the forces as well. So we'd be looking at the males and females from Ledbury that served. Th though with this, it's always difficult to know where you start and stop. Is it just Ledbury or would it include some of the outlying places, mm. uh, perhaps Wellington Heath, Parkway, Eastnor, Donington, those places which are fairly close and would have looked very much to Ledbury as their centre. And then, of course, when did they live in Ledbury? Did they live in Ledbury before the war, after the war? It needs a little bit of thinking about as to actually who... Uh, uh, who should be included in it. And I'm thinking about that at the moment before I, I, I launch mm. the appeal for names. Mm. But certainly if anybody in the meantime is interested and has got some information, they're very welcome to contact us at the museum, aren't they, Andy? Yep, absolutely. The e email address is on the website and uh, can contact us. Uh, that's probably the easiest way. Mm. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. Well, we've had a great day walking around Ledbury, uh, old haunts. Brought some memories back. <laughs> uh, if you if you like taking a walk in the sun with us and like to hear more, don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast with your chosen podcast supplier. The Herefordshire Light Infantry Museum also publish regular updates on our YouTube page and website. And all the links to that are in the podcast description. So for the moment, Andy, from you, me and the squeaky bar stool, see you next time. Where, where are we off to next time, Andy? Well, we think we might have a wander around Rotherworth, aren't mm. we? The, the Rotherworth ammunition factory out the other side of Hereford was a massive site, now rapidly being changed into an industrial complex. But during the First and Second World War, there was quite a history mm. to it. Mm. 
So until then, and there might possibly be a sneaky additional Christmas broadcast as well. Until we speak to you again, here's, here's to you. Cheers. Until the next time we take a walk in the sun. Cheers. Cheers.